Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in out Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin podcast. Episode number 132. I'm your first host, Marcello. And I'm host number two, B. Host number three, Corey. And I should be sounding a little bit better because I got a new mic. What's up? Yeah. Thanks, Lane. Thank you, Lane. Dr. Miller, we appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. I hope we we all sound really well. At least, and, at least uh, the same. I, We're all working on the exact same microphone, so we should at least sound yeah. the same. Yeah, it'll, it'll sound similar. He said I'm too young to know uh, presidents of the United States of America, but I mean, you watch Dick Van Dyke, so I think we're we're of <laughs> age. Nobody, I nobody Dick watches Van Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> yeah, no. Do you, Go ahead. Were you watching Dick Van Dyke? Like, yeah, all my friends are watching this with me right now. Everyone around the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dude. I thought everyone watched Nick at Night and everyone watched Dick Van Dyke because that was clearly the best one. And then there was also that other show that was, I thought was kind of boring with the whistling. I was like, do 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 do. What was that one called? With Andy whistling. Griffin. But Andy that Griffin was show. old Nick at Night, man. That was Andy, Andy Griffin show. Was like Roseanne, Fresh Prince, more Fresh Prince, and then it was just all Fresh Prince. <laughs> And then it just kind of disappeared. Roseanne, Fresh Prince, Fresh Prince, Fresh Prince. Cosby. It was like Cosby and then like more Fresh Prince. Ooh, I bet Cosby got nixed probably overnight. Like it was there and then it wasn't. Anyway. (laughs) Oh, yeah. We got a good show because Eric Voorhees is on here, who hasn't been on the show in 125 episodes. Was he that early? Was he like 15? Yeah, no, man. He, seven. Remember, I got so pumped, I tweeted him and didn't I'm expect anything. Up. I'm looking. And up. he was like, "Yeah, I'll come on." And then we, like, I did the typical happy dance that I do when I land a big guest that I don't think I can land. I'm looking and it up. I'm on the show. Yeah, it was real early. It was in, within the first fifteen. Episodes. I don't believe this. No, I checked it out. It was number seven. And he was rich as shit then, and he's rich as shit now. He's way more <laughs> richer now. He's way yeah. more richer now. <laughs> yeah, he's richer now. So yeah. uh, I bet you dudes figured out a way to get pre moistened to toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> like, this what is shit, that? Like, oh, whoa, like, whoa. What is pre moistened toilet paper? Because we all know if you put so, a drop of water on toilet paper, it's done for. Okay, essentially it would be like moist wipes. So I figured there's a really European thing that European gentlemen do is after they're done getting their wipe on, they actually use a little wet wipe, and then they get a dry wipe. So it's dry, wet, dry, right? You get real clean down there, right? So I started doing it, no lie. I was like, this is a pretty good strat. And so (laughs) I do it. A shat strat? It's a good shat strat. Like By the way, after you're done... Episode number seven, Eric Voorhees. Eric at number seven, right? And so so a moist moist toilet paper would basically be moist wipes, but in toilet paper form. And so you'd have to like it had to like come out of the wall. There'd be like a robotic arm that it keeps it moist throughout the day, but then when you need it, when you sit on the toilet, a We're photo done eye We're done would here. catch that you sat on the toilet and then your moist toilet paper comes We're out of the We're wall. We're done here. Let's move on. All right. And now Eric Voorhees. <laughs> and Eric Voorhees. Here he is. All right, guys. Today we have Eric Voorhees on the show to talk about 
how far Shapeshift has come in the uh, in the cryptocurrency community, as well as uh, the new platform he's created, Prism. So, Eric, why don't you? Um, you're, you've been on the show previously, so we kind of those who don't know can maybe read about you. It's very easy to know where you came from and and how you got into the space. But would you mind telling us how how you felt the space has kind of transformed over the past year and um, and and who you are? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've been in the Bitcoin world, I guess, for about six years at this point, which kind of makes me an old man. Hmm. And uh, so I've seen it rise from this little, little tech fascination by, uh, you know, thousand people on the Internet to this global phenomenon where every major financial institution is researching and, and building with this technology. Um, and <laughs> Bitcoin has risen by you know, cr- you know, just crazy percentage gains, uh, and it has spawned this whole universe of different blockchains and different assets that are experimenting in every different direction. So it's been really exciting to see this. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I dreamed would happen back in 2011, and it is happening. The, this technology really is starting to grow to to become a fairly uh, significant force in the world. And um, I think that's going to keep continuing. Over the last year, certainly the big theme is uh, is tokens. And Ethereum has gotten big enough now to where people realize that um, blockchains are, and, and even blockchain assets are about more than just currency. Uh, and now that there are you know at, at least two really significant blockchains out there, um, it's just spawned this whole this whole world of of people experimenting with different tokens and different models and and now these token sales over the last six months have just been the, the a crazy phenomenon to see um so it's all been really exciting and it's, it still feels very much like the wild west in all the best senses of that term yeah definitely the, the token sales have t- taken on a new life form of their own i mean you could i think this was brought up during the token summit which you recently talked at um, I was watching it. You're kind of credited and with being one of the earlier progenitors of not this ideology of one coin to rule them all. I mean, Shapeshift is, is is the embodiment of that, and its success shows that you were you were pretty right, spot on with the fact that people care about other coins. But do you do you almost see an over exuberance with this mentality? Totally. I mean. Unquestionably, the industry is entering or is well into another bubble. Um, that should be obvious to everyone. Uh, but it's also okay. There's no way that this technology grows and expands without having these bubbles because the, the, these innovations are so exciting that you you can't just have something that's um, profoundly new and expect uh, gains that are moderate and steady. Mm-hmm. Because that, that just doesn't work with human psychology so the bubbles are inevitable um they are part of the growth they've been prevalent in bitcoin which is now in its third or fourth bubble depending on how you count it um the the token sale model is absolutely in a bubble and no one knows how high it'll go or when it'll pop or how far it'll fall um and so i think the important point is a that it's in a bubble and b that that's okay and whenever the bubble pops that's fine. It'll be bloody, but the the, the model of raising f- uh, funding through these liquid tokens is is absolutely going to stay around, just like the model of moving money around the world instantly stayed around even after Bitcoin's first bubble popped. Yeah, definitely. And with Prism, I guess we'll we'll, we'll jump right into that. But Prism is, if, if I'm correct, a opportunity for people to speculate in this new crazy token field. Um, almost at their leisure without signing up for an account. Yeah. Um, Prism, the, the challenge it was trying to address was that people who want to buy digital assets have two uh, crappy options right now. One is you uh, sign up at an exchange, go through that whole thing, and then you buy all the, all the assets there and you, you leave them there because – it's relatively easy to leave them on the exchange. And if we're being honest, that's really what most people do. Absolutely. And that's really dangerous for all the obvious reasons. So that's that's what most people do. And then the people who want to be more safe and have learned their lessons from the various 
from the many exchanges that have gone bust is that they have to download all sorts of wallets and sync all the blockchains and download uh, and um, you know keep things up to date, manage all the keys. And that's a huge pain in the butt. And if you don't do it right, it can actually be even less safe than leaving your money at an exchange. So people have this horrible option of something that's really inconvenient, uh, but maybe safe if you do it right, or something that's somewhat inconvenient, but uh, totally not safe. And so PRISM is essentially a way to um, get exposure to a basket of digital assets without having to leave your funds at an exchange and without having to download clients for all the coins that you want to hold. So it is both much faster and easier and also much safer than what people have as their options today. I, I definitely can can agree with um, the problem you've just laid out because I've, I've essentially done both sides of the things. I, mean, I, I try and test all the new mm -hmm. wallets. I try and understand and and evaluate all of the different technologies coming out. And that's that, that means I'm downloading and trying all kinds of different things. And the PKI or managing all the private keys associated with that is is really annoying. And then you have the other side of it where I'm then allowing others to become a custodian of my private keys, which means that I don't really hold on to my money, which is the point yep. of all of this in the first yep. place. <laughs> and and there there aren't a lot of options in the middle. And so you're leveraging Ethereum smart contracts to allow people to start getting the best of both worlds. Yeah, exactly. To have it be more secure and more easy than what they have now. And and that's sort of Shapeshift's model. Uh, before Shapeshift, people could buy and convert one coin into another coin. But Shapeshift made it safer and it made it easier. And uh, really, that's the same principle that we're applying with Prism. So how do you see this going? Because as Shapeshift got bigger and bigger and bigger, you started to see it get integrated into a lot of platforms. Say, for instance, if I'm a if I'm a store and I only want to hold Bitcoin, I can use Shapeshift integrated into my platform to allow anyone to pay with whatever coin they want, and I end up getting Bitcoin. Um, yep. So you started to see this kind of social behavior of of interoperability with using Shapeshift at a, 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 a kind of like a um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not having to sign up for anything, which made the things really liquid mm -hmm. and nice to use. Do you see something similar happening with Prism? Yeah. Um, so everything we build, we build with the intention of it being primarily an API. And so Shapeshift is primarily an API. Most of our volume comes uh, over the API from other sources. And what that allows is, is for people anywhere in the world to instantly convert any digital asset into any other without that person having to sign up at a third party or deal with any friction of of doing it the fir their first time. And I, I think that's really important for the growth of crypto is for people to be able to do what they wish with as little friction as possible. Because one of the great advantages of this technology is to have uh, digital value that can go anywhere instantly and uh, it doesn't need friction uh, intrinsically added to it. So. Prism will have an API in the same way, and we expect most of the usage of Prism will actually come over the API, you know, a year or two after it's uh, after uh, from from now. I mean, it's it's clear you've put a lot of work into this, right? You, you've 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 tried to develop this so that it can grow into this thing, and you probably didn't do that without having some type of, um, I guess forward thinking ideas of where this could grow into do you have, can you can, like, can you help elucidate our listeners as to where you see this going and, and what type of integrations you might see in the future yeah i mean the the macro trend is is just the digital finance is going to replace analog finance and that means that blockchain based infrastructure is going to replace um analog banking fiat infrastructure like I, I feel like that's an inevitable trend of humanity that will occur mm -hmm. and i'm amazed that a lot of people are so resistant to that idea especially anyone who's used a bank especially tried to send money internationally or do anything outside of little the little normal box um that world is going to go away and in its place will be a whole new world of uh digital tokens digital forms of value representing all sorts of things that are done on an analog level today and a whole world of new things that aren't that can't be done in the analog world today so just as 
just as the internet didn't just move phone calls to the to VoIP, uh, it actually created whole new ways of communicating. Uh, digital value in blockchains will not just replace the transfer of money or currency from one place to another, but will enable uh, all sorts of new ways of uh, cr creating value, moving value, assigning value to things. Um, and that's going to be really exciting. So given that that's the macro trend, Shapeshift uh, and, and Prism to the same degree uh, are built to to welcome that world, basically built to allow a world where tokens are everywhere to exist easily. Shapeshift being the way to convert one into another for delivery of that other, and Prism being the way that anyone can sort of speculate on this stuff ahead of time and get easy exposure to this asset class, which it now is uh, as it grows. Yeah, I guess if I could maybe try and re-say what you just said, like I, I talk about this this concept that you mentioned quite a bit, in that when you make a technology that generalizes the old technology, the first thing people do is try and use the models of the old technology to describe the new one, which inherently will fail. And yep. what you've done or what you're trying to do is create tools built from the ground up in the mind frame of the new technology so that real emergent behavior can actually start to take place. And people aren't creating things based on the old financial or transactional models that we're all accustomed to. Yeah, and a great and simple example of that point is that when Bitcoin came out, everyone, including the people that were Bitcoiners, including myself, called it money mm -hmm. and went around referring to it as money. Um, and that I, that was wrong. I, I wrote a blog post a few months ago about how it was it was wrong of us to to label Bitcoin money, because it's really it it can be used as money, but it can be used in all sorts of other ways. And the problem with that old definition is that now you have some regulators around the world that have regulated Bitcoin as money or or want to. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, uh, for example, with Factum, which is a way of storing a hash of information in the Bitcoin blockchain. That Bitcoin transaction that occurs to store that information uh, is not, by any reasonable definition, a transfer of money. Bitcoin in that way is not being used as money. And so if it's regulated as money, then you have an obvious problem. And I think you're going to see this throughout the blockchain industry where people try to pigeonhole this technology into one thing or another. And uh, it's, it's just going to cause all sorts of confusion at best and a, a bunch of, you know, messy interactions between governments and private industry at worst. Absolutely. Especially when you have a lot of the kind of the regulators are, are, are very far behind the pace at which the innovation is taking happening. So they're trying to put a lot of very, um, they're trying to put circles into squares. You just can't fit it right. And there's always going to be something extra that you're not getting. And, and so like, what do you, how do we how do we fix this? Like, what do we do to change the narrative, or how do we start talking about blockchain that starts to then give the right intuition to those who are getting into the space? I'm not sure, and I, and I don't know if like a if a centrally curated and planned message would even do the trick. Um, the, the technology <laughs> is yeah, the, the technology is decentralized. It does not exist in a specific jurisdiction or among people with a certain language. It's just moving in every direction um, all over the place. And there, there isn't a way to encapsulate it into a nice package for a regulator. That's kind of the point. Um, so it's really going to be kind of a existential issue for the regulators because a whole bunch of things that they were used to doing when they had ultimate power over banking and all the fiat networks that controlled value that was very top down. Now that's gone. And you can't just recreate all the regulations on an entirely new infrastructure that does not support uh, the fiat banking that they that they had control of before. Um, so this is really a problem for them to figure out. I mean, those of us in the crypto industry, we're just busy building. And there's no way that the regulators are going to ever catch up to it. And, and that's good in my book. I definitely can agree with the fact that there's no way they're going to be able to catch up. And something that I was kind of curious about, but where you stand, you see a lot of... Um, new things come into play because you have to vet what gets put on shapeshift and now prism. Um, how do you not exactly 
We don't I, we don't vet what gets put onto Shapeshift. We okay. take a look at the market and say what tokens have high trade volume um, over a you know reasonable amount of time. Um, and if they have a high trade volume, then we consider adding them to the platform. So we really just watch the market and see what the market's doing. And if if a coin looks popular, then we consider adding it. So it's almost as if the you're you're allowing the the crowd to vet a coin for you because if it has that much trade volume, there's at least a certain amount of desire for it. And what you're trying to do is just provide tools for those who have a desire. Yeah. So I mean, anyone who's being honest should know that most of these tokens will fail. Mm -hmm. Most of them will will fall towards zero over time, just as most startups fail, and that's fine and normal. Um, but the marketplace basically has to figure that out. The market has to figure out which projects actually have real merit, real utility. And no single person can do that vetting. It, it has to emerge from consensus, it has to emerge from the marketplace. So our, our job at Shapeshift is not to vet these things. It is simply to make it easier to either buy it or sell it. By simply making something more liquid, we allow the market to figure this, these questions out more easily with less friction. So that's that's the role that we play. Seems as though if I, I, I come from a physics background, so I almost see a lot of the tools that you create as just accelerants to equilibrium. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's really neat. I've always been a fan of, of kind of what y'all have done and, and, the, and the tact you take into creating the products that you've created, especially in the early days when, I mean, when Shapeshift was created, it was what, Bitcoin and Litecoin, maybe? Yeah, and I think a lot of people thought I had gone off the deep end because I was, I was well known, you know, as a Bitcoiner, and for a while I had been a, a Bitcoin maximalist, and I said bad things about alts, <laughs> and that was a really naive viewpoint that I had, and I've since changed it. But when I created Shapeshift, um, and it was only, you know, Litecoin, Namecoin, and Dogecoin, um, <laughs> you know, thirty-three percent of the of the altcoins out there were based on a a dog joke. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think a lot of people were like, what, what the hell are you doing? And they, what they didn't realize was that digital assets were this entirely new asset class that was going to build and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was not just about having 500 different forms of currency. I, I, I still think in, you know, 20 or 50 years, you're not going to have, um, 500 different cryptocurrencies, but you will have millions of different tokens doing all sorts of things. And maybe there's maybe there's one or maybe there's a few primary uh, means of exchange that, that that become the real source of money, but that does not mean that there's only going to be one token. Um, and that's that's the thing I think that a lot of people have missed, and especially a lot of the Bitcoin maximalists. I guess moving along that nerve, do you feel like because um, the ideology that pushed Bitcoin is still very very relevant in the Bitcoin community that um, it's going to get it's going to get passed up? Uh, how do you mean? Like, it seems as though the ability to innovate in the Bitcoin community is 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 retarded due to the ideology that it is only money and should be money. It's not willing to pivot to kind of take this more broad generalization of what this technology can do. And others are certainly willing to try and take that, fill that role. Do you think that it's, it's I guess, dominance among the space will wane if not go away over time if it doesn't if it isn't able to keep up um i think its dominance will wane if it is not able to get through the scaling debate um and i don't think it has another three years to figure it out i think it's going to be you know within 12 months maybe within six months um it's going to be clear if, if bitcoin's going to like get through this and it it almost doesn't matter which of the courses it takes, whether it, whether it has a, a user activated soft fork that happens in August this summer, or whether one of the compromises like a, a Segwit 2x happens. Like it, it almost doesn't matter which one, mm -hmm. as long as something can happen and move it forward. Then then I think Bitcoin's going to be in a really great place. Um, so I'm I'm pretty hopeful. I I'm very bullish on Bitcoin in the long term, but but quite bearish uh, until that until that issue gets sorted. We get over that. Um, but there, yeah. Um, in terms of innovation, I mean, certainly Bitcoin is more rigid and less versatile than something like Ethereum. Yeah. But that's not sure. necessarily only a bad thing. Um, Bitcoin is, is simpler. 
and it has a, a smaller attack surface. It has more history, and it's not um, it's it's more it's more stable. It's used for less different things, and that might give it an ultimate virtue as you know the the main form of money, or, or at least the main form of um, value Stability. that's held in in crypto. Um, so we'll we'll see, but. I think importantly, it shouldn't really matter to anyone who cares about this stuff, which coins come to dominate. And I think there will be a lot of different coins that, that become really big, but it shouldn't really matter to people who care about this new form of uh, free market money and the, all the promise. It doesn't bring that promise only under the brand of Bitcoin. If Bitcoin fails, the idea of cryptocurrency is not going to fail. Something else will just have taken its place. Uh, and all the virtues of cryptocurrency and all the things that people care about will still continue on into that other that other token and and that's like the ultimate form of decentralization is that not even there's not even one blockchain that has all the power it, it, it a blockchain can fall and go away and others will rise and take its place and that's what makes this industry i think um impermeable to defeat ultimately yeah, it's one of those things that's that we've opened Pandora's box. There's no putting it back in. It's it's here to stay mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form. Um, moving moving back a little bit more towards Prism, can you can you walk us through the steps of what it's going to be like, or what it's like now to open up a Prism? Yeah. Um, so essentially, a user goes to the website Prism Exchange, and all they need to use it is a Ethereum wallet and some Ethereum is collateral. Uh, and then they uh, basically declare what portfolio they, they want to build. So let's say someone wants a portfolio that's 30% Litecoin, 20% Dash, and 50% uh, Augur. Um, they de declare that proportion, and then they choose you know how big they want the portfolio to be, whether it's $10 or $10,000. And then the site uh, asks, asks for their Ethereum public key, and then it awaits their, them to send their collateral. And once their collateral is sent, if they have a, a $10,000 prism, for example, if they need to send $10,000 of Ethereum into the smart contract, which is all just done through the web interface. It's really simple. And then uh, Shapeshift also puts the same amount of collateral into the smart contract and takes the opposite side of the portfolio, meaning the user is going long on those coins and Shapeshift is going short on those coins. And then as soon as that happens, uh, the smart contract sort of has a life of its own on the Ethereum network and it operates under the rules of the smart contract code. It watches the values or the prices of the underlying um, constituent components. And then whenever the user decides, uh, he or she can close the prism and receives back the right amount of Ethereum from the portfolio. So if the portfolio went up, then, then the user will get back more F than they put in. Seems simple. Um, but there, yeah, there's also the goal. A, a, it's definitely the goal, and it's it's it, it goes in line with how you've built your other products. There's a fees associated with this. So what, what can they, what can a user expect in terms of how much money they're willing to pay for the service? Yeah. Um, so when we when we released it, we had a certain fee structure that we had assumed would work, uh, but we got a lot of backlash around one of the fees. So we have since changed it. And what the fees are now is uh, that there's no fees or anything to open a prism. And when you close it, there's a 2.4% fee that happens on the close. And that's essentially our revenue model. Um, there's also a half a percent fee if you rebalance. So if you take you know 10% of your portfolio and change it into a different coin when you rebalance, there's a half a percent fee on that 10%. Um, and then the, and, and that's it right now. That, that that's the fee structure. During oh, the closed wow. beta, all the, all the fees are waived, uh, so um, it's it's free anyway. But ultimately, that 2.4% will be the way that Shapeshift makes money from the product. Um, and what people were upset about when we launched it was a monthly fee that we had uh, included, which was 1% per month. And the 1% was sort of just a, a round number to choose to get it started. And 
basically what that number pays for is the capital that is put into the prisms to back the other side. Uh, and in the first phase of prism, Shapeshift is always putting up the capital to back every single prism. So it's very capital intensive because mm -hmm. it's fully collateralized, which is what allows it to be uh, trustless. Um, but the goal was always that Shapeshift would not be the only entity to put up the other side. So ultimately, we'll allow people to go short on prisms and to take the other side of the of the long position. And when that market is mature, what you'll have is a bunch of people going long and a bunch of people going short. And the way you incentivize one side or the other to, to come into the market is that the bigger side pays uh, like a time-based fee, like a monthly fee to the smaller side. And then some equilibrium will be established at which the whole thing works smoothly. So long-term, uh, there will be a monthly fee However, depending on if you're going long or short, and depending on the market variables at the time, that fee will, will go up and down and might actually be negative such that you make money by holding a prism open. That's pretty fascinating. I do some, I've done some, sometimes do some margin trading on the different exchanges. And whenever you do um, a margin trade, you pay, you pay a, basically a percentage fee on what you're actually taking as collateral when you do these margins, right? Uh, which is which is reasonable because you're playing with money you don't have. Um, right. And, and I'm, I'm, that's quite excited to hear that you've taken away the monthly fee because it seemed as though that's somewhat of a, I guess, normal way of dealing with collateral, but in the long term, how these things will interrupt with each other is once again, a generalization of what we're used to in terms of margin trading. Right. Yeah. And so, we, you know, we had set it at 1% just as in the early phase until we mm -hmm. had moved to that two-sided market. So since we'll be at that place before the system gets big, you know, we, in our discussions, we realized since that 1% per month is like the biggest pain point for the consumers. And since until the platform's large, it wouldn't be any considerable revenue anyway. That's a great thing to just set to zero until we move into the second phase where it's a market-based rate. That's and funny. it's hard for people to argue with a market-based rate. Yeah, it really is. I think that you, they really can't argue with something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. I'm really excited to, to play around with these. Um, do you? Is there something that I should have asked you that I I didn't get around to that you'd like to tell our listeners? Um, I, well, I think a really important point of of Prism is not just that it's kind of a, a cool new product, uh, but that it's it it's arguably the first commercial product, the first commercial financial product built on Ethereum smart contracts that's actually live. Um, Ethereum smart contracts has been sort of this really sci-fi thing with huge hype and huge potential, but not, not really many examples of it actually being used yet. Mm -hmm. So Prism may be the first or one of the first you know, serious financial products built on Ethereum smart contracts. And I'm hopeful that it will demonstrate to the crypto community that Smart contracts really are, um, really are cool. They they have utility. They can be used for things. They they're not a panacea, and if you don't do them right, you can have colossal failure. But they represent a really amazing tool for rebuilding all sorts of different financial products in a in a trustless way, or at least in a way where you're trusting open source code instead of trusting. Which I think most people in the in this community, that you know, that's that's their goal is to move trust from fallible humans into open source code. I could not agree with that anymore. I think that's a great way of wrapping this up. And I, of course, we got to end with our final question is that in uh, 10 words or less, can you explain blockchain? <laughs> a blockchain is a ledger, which is shared among computers. I think that's under 10 words and that, sure I'm not is. sure I can get much more. <laughs> it sure is. You nailed it right on the head. Uh, pretty, pretty <laughs> elementary definition. But there you yeah, go. I like, I like hearing, I like trying to see how people who've been talking about this for as long as you have try and abstract away to the most fundamental thing of what we're dealing with. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have the advantage of not being an engineer, so I only understand this stuff at a high level. And sometimes that gives me a, a good ability to convey it at a high level. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks again for all the work you've done for the community and um, and, the, and the products you've built for us. 
I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on the show. All right. See you around. Cheers. Before we, we start recording. And we're back. That was Eric Voorhees talking about Prism. Where the fuck did D go? Maybe he oh. went to go use an Athena Bitcoin ATM. Oh, tell me about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're the most trusted name in Bitcoin ATMs. They're located in Chicago, Florida, Houston. They are internationally known. Actually, they're not. Actually, they're you, you literally just said more cities that are outside of Texas for the first time that you've ever you've ever said before. Yeah, I think it's important to know that their reach goes beyond Texas. But you can download the Athena Bitcoin wallet on the App Store or Google Play, and you can figure out all the locations because they're scattered everywhere. Get get all that information because they're always adding new locations. And we're also brought to you by Athena Bitcoin's portfolio company, Bitquick.co, the secure, quick, and easy peer-to-peer Bitcoin marketplace where you can get Bitcoin for cash in as little as three hours. They've been serving Bitcoiners for four years, people. That's actually that's what like, I was introduced to. That's like an eternity in Bitcoin space. Yeah. yeah, man. Four years is a hell of a long time. Bits big quick. Get your bits quick. <laughs> Wait, that's, that's the Jetsons. The, that's, that's the one. No, that's it's not. not. No, it's not. That's not the oh, no, Jetsons. That's the Flint, I mean, that's the Flintstones. That is not the Flintstones either. It's a biz quick. Get your Bitcoin. Like, their uh, ATM is trusted. Yeah. <laughs> You're making shit up, but that was good. I like that. <laughs> Does the Flintstones still have copyright ad or copyrights or whatever feel, the hell you need to still feel shit? like they're old enough. You could probably get away with it. Yeah. yeah. Big quick. Get your Bitcoins. It's the modern fucking ATM. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> that's not going to work. <laughs> Sorry. Um, pardon my language. If you have children listening, just tell them that the F word is uh, it's a colloquial term, term of endearment. So, um, what are we talking about today? I want to talk about. Okay, so you made a tweet that caught my eye, you, sir, Eddie, and I did, you I did, said I that you tweeted something. It wasn't a retweet. It was an original thought. It was an original tweet. A golden tweet is what I call it. And you said something along the lines of like, "We in the act of you didn't say this but i'm paraphrasing in the act of trying to disintermediate things we may have created even better intermediaries oh no it's it's this it's this i forget the actual exact words of my tweet but it's I this too. crazy it's this crazy irony that we've created and yes everyone that preaches the ideology of i keep saying that goddamn word everyone that preaches the point of blockchain is disintermediation. Yet, as we grow the infrastructure out, it's only creating new mediaries to make things more convenient for people to do things. Like we've we've done, we've ironically created just a shitload of new intermediaries. You know what the problem is, though, is there's a gap in education, a gap can, that's never that going to be crossed. Because the chasm between the old and the new is so large that it's going to take centralized people to push that cat, like to decrease that chasm. Chasm, chasm, chasm. Such a right. cool word. Well, like well, so, that's the thing. It's like, so right now, the reason why these, inter- like these mediaries exist or these intermediaries exist is because they're placating to the end user because using this technology is too difficult to do right now. Is it though? Is it though? It is. That's, that's all right. How? Stop. I stop. Okay. I want to buy Bitcoin. How do I do it? Not Coinbase. We're going to talk all about that BS, but not Coinbase. All right, cool. Not Coinbase. How do I Bitcoin? How do I buy Bitcoin? Gemini intermediary. So walk me Bit through pay. it. Yeah, but walk, it's not walk available me through everywhere it. though. Walk me through it. It's not available in your state. Okay. You this do? would be my this would be my new advice. This would be this would be my new advice. Look. Buying Bitcoin has 
suddenly become a hurdle. So this is what I recommend. I recommend that you just get paid in Bitcoin. I recommend that the very same way you set up direct deposit with your company, you fill out another one of those forms, and instead you get paid in Bitcoin. I don't want Bitcoin. I want Ethereum. How do I buy it as an, as an American? Tell me. You want tell Ether? Me, walk me through it. How do I buy Ethereum as an American? Well, here's the thing. Let me correct you, noob. It would be Ether, okay? You want to buy Ether. That's where the conversation starts. Cool. Ethereum is the network. You noob. Cool. No, okay, that's not how I talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> Ether is what you want to buy. Let me I tell have, you. I got you cold, buy. hard cash. I want to buy some Ether. What do I do? Okay. Let me look up the market price real quick. I'm going to set you up with a wallet, and you're going to pay me about 20% over that market price, and I will send that Ether to uh, you. Just, just point them to an exchange. That's all you got to do. Oh, really? Which one? Go, Which one takes US to, dollars? Go to bestbitcoinexchange.io. It's the aggregator of the best exchanges really? where you can explore and make the best decision yourself. Kind of like Lending That's a Tree. Thing? That's a thing? That's yeah. a thing? Where'd you... Yeah. you when it's a reg- it's a regularly updated list of exchanges. So if you're buying for the first time or you're trading professionally, you can use that. It's, it's, it's by the way, it's this, you, this is this is not a sponsor for us. Yeah, <laughs> we are I not pushing this. <laughs> we, are, we are not pushing this. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty legit. I'm looking yeah, this up right now. Okay, so by the right, way, that's, that's okay, cool. First one, Coinbase. Cool. I can buy Ethereum with Coinbase if I have cold hard cash. I can buy Ethereum with Coinbase. Hey, That's number one. You can buy Ether. You can buy number Ether. Number two. Shut up. If number two, pull up Ponix. <laughs> I cannot, <laughs> yeah. as far as I know, buy you can Ether. Can send USD to Poloniex. Can you? Mm-hmm. You can wire it to them. Local it's Bitcoins, definitely. You definitely can buy Ether with local Bitcoins. Eh? Nope. You can't buy Ether with local Bitcoins. No, you right, can't. Let's, let's just say you go there. Once you're comfortable with the technology and you understand all the different sites to buy Bitcoin, with you know each of those websites has its own advantages, right? Okay. You can try BitSquare, which is a completely decentralized exchange, and it's very promising. This is my fucking point. Yeah, there's so this many things. The entire that conversation we've just had isn't go here, buy Ethereum. It's there's there's steps. That. I Either can say whatever I want. The shit out of me now. People don't understand what we're talking about. There's there is no one step to buying a cryptocurrency. It's either go through Coinbase or buy Bitcoin somewhere, go somewhere else and buy the cryptocurrency you'd like to buy. This is not an easy process. Yet. Yeah. And then even if you do make it through the process you can't make it rain on the stripper with any of this cryptocurrency. And that is definitely a con on, on the pros and cons scale that nobody talks about often enough. There's still no nobody make it rain app about it. On, on strippers. Yeah. Make it rain. No, somebody needs to make the make it rain app and be a bajillionaire already. All right. Keep some cash up there in the ceiling. And when you go on your app and you choose to make it rain, you can actually pull down and it will control the velocity at which the cast falls from the ceiling. So what, what happens in the future, because this is inevitable, in my opinion, mm-hmm. when there is no physical cash? Uh, what are strippers going to do? What are strippers going to do when they can there keep, is no okay. physical cash? I know what they can do. Like You can put augmented reality glasses on, and then you could throw the cash at them with your phone. Like You could swipe up and throw the cash on them. That's that's not gonna work with your augmented reality glasses. Wait, wasn't Clampta Peter Clampta making a Las Vegas strip club? That, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is he what needs those, to happen. He and, and sorry like for, six times. Sorry for the children listening. You might want to put your earmuffs on. Parents, tell your kids to put your earmuffs on. But a stripper needs to put half of a QR code on the right cheek and half on the left. And it'll be the challenge is to scan that QR code when the clapping occurs. We make it clap. Sean Paul reference. I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sean DePaul. 
<laughs> Do you think he talks like that all the time? No, like, never. You know, he he like probably has an Eng- he probably has an English accent. There's, it's all fake. It's like know. Shaggy. Think, Shaggy think, doesn't talk like that. I think if he's like, this is what he's like. Uh, if he were just chilling in his house, right, and he's there with his girl, and he pours a bowl of cereal, and there's no milk, he would go like. You drank all the milk. Like, I think he would talk like that. I think he bona fide would talk. Just give me the milk. Just give me the milk. I like, like, drink the drink. Yeah. I don't know what you just said, Corey. You didn't say it. I didn't because that's how, that's how, like, Jamaican rappers sing. That's how Rihanna used to sing. We got way off topic. We were talking about something important. No, we weren't. Well, let's talk about the other. Let's talk about the other thing important that we wanted to talk about. Um, earlier this week, if you guys do watch or listen or follow uh, Ken Bosack with Bitcoin Talk, um, unbeknownst to him, he promoted, he was paid to promote something that actually ended up being a scammy scam. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, what was it called? BitConnect is what it was no. called. Ethereum Apparently, chamber. Ethereum chamber. Sorry. BitConnect is the other scam that it's like he went on a, he went, he went ghostbusters on scams this week. So the first one was Ethereum chamber, which was essentially looked like a really well put together Ethereum wallet. There's a and reason. I'll, take a, I'll, I'll, I'll dive into this when you're finished here, but go ahead. I'll, I'll take a little bit of, uh, not a little bit. I'll take onus because Ken did pass it through me first. And I looked at it, and I was like, yeah, this seems really legit. It looks like a really nice wallet. It kind of emulates my Ethereum wallet. It looks really nice. Yeah, I mean, if they're paying you, go on ahead. Um, and he went ahead with it. He promoted it, and then it ended up being a scam. And then what's even worse is when he wrote out, wrote to the guy like, hey, you scammed everybody. That's real messed up. The guy actually responded back in the email to Ken that said, yeah, it was a scam. I made a couple milli, and now I'm done. Thanks for the money. So he's like, I paid you 200 and I made a couple milli. Thanks for the money. Which means that that guy is a piece of shit. And, you know, I hope that one day he actually is living the life of a piece of shit. And that's drying out on somebody's grass. We need pieces of shit like that, though, because as Ethereum grows, he actually helped develop the safety features in the future. They're going to make it more secure. Yeah, but I mean that's still shitty. And I was just so, saying. So has got a point here. And so like this is this is an issue with open open <laughs> open source, source software, right? So my Ether wallet, Mew, is 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 this typically called the shorthand, makes a fantastic product. They are a pillar of the Ethereum community. And without them, a good portion of the ICOs and transactions that have gone through the Ethereum network wouldn't be possible. They've made it very easy for people to safely store private keys, wallets, so on and so forth, invest in different projects, so on and so forth. They've been, I can't say it again, a pillar of the community, but they're an open source project, which means that it doesn't take much from a savvy person to completely copy the project, change the front end, change some of the source code, and then offer up a new wallet that looks very legitimate. And from and from a surface level, as you've seen, Dimitri, it looks legit. But they off they, they change a few pieces of code that says, well, in, it, instead of you know you keeping all of your private keys on your local computer, we're going to keep them in our own computer. And that's exactly what yeah. they did, right? They just said we they yep. copied the entire code, all of the legitimateness of my Ether wallet, and said instead of doing things correctly, we're going to do things completely opposite and keep all private keys with us. And as they gained use, a user base that is that people kept putting money into their wallets because it looked legitimate on the on the on the surface. Uh huh. They just said, "All right, we got enough money." fuck everybody and they just took all that money and it's very yeah, difficult to vet from a service level whether or not they're just copying somebody who's really legitimate because it's an open source project i can fork my ether wallet and do the exact same thing myself very easily i can make mm. an ico 
that seems really legitimate, but when I make a lot of money, I can walk away. It's very difficult to vet these projects. And if you don't have the like the communication, the team of of like people behind the projects, then mm-hmm. there's no way to know whether or not you're serious and what you're doing isn't a scam because it's very easy to scam in the space. And that's exactly you know what, what they I, did. And you know Ken, what I kind of see happening? Yeah, Ken can't ahead, be faulted for this. No. Because it's very difficult. I'll own what I did. I went through the website. I looked through it. I didn't send any Ethereum to it because I don't just send my shit anywhere. But it looked really legit. And I was like, yeah, Ken, let it rip. Yeah, it looked legit because so, it, it, it copied a very legitimate source. Yeah, I mean, it looked legit. Can I say so. bullet dodge, though? Because Cointelegraph got a lot of heat for promoting that. I'm well, so glad we're not tied sounds, with that bullshit. I'm, I'm happy we're not a part of them, too. It's like, like they did the same thing. They did a very surface scan of what the project was and then assumed it was a good one. I imagine that this scam paid Cointelegraph mm-hmm. quite a bit of money to then Put it through them. Yep. I'm going to do like, a live pro tip right now. If you are listening to our show and you are working for the United States Air Force Cyber Warfare Division, I don't know what the hell it's called, but I know it exists. You're going to have a very, you're going to be a very, very valuable person here within the next decade. And you need to develop yourself because in the event cryptocurrency and digital assets do become as prolific as we think they will there are going to be a lot of individuals with your skill sets that are needed to track down scummy assholes like the person who's responsible for the ethereum chamber Um, because it's very possible see what what do you think my company does no you're not are you supposed to say that did you just get in trouble just now no i have no clearance oh okay Man, you better be careful saying shit like that. All right. Like, like, um, like my company is I didn't responsible know that's what your company for tracking does, down but... people like that. <laughs> okay. Well, damn, Corey. I didn't know you were a cyber cop. Fuck I'm not. I don't do any of that shit. Oh, okay. That's not my job. <laughs> All right. I am the law. Fucking Judge Dredd over here. I make, I make educational courses. I teach people how to, what Bitcoin is. Okay. Well, anyways. I don't know. I, I just thought I'd bring that up uh, so that we, we do support all the shows, all the people that are a part of our network that are working with us. You know, we got got together. Um, I'll tell you this so much. If you are listening. What's up? Yeah. Ken, Ken Bosak is the real deal. He is 100% dedicated to trying to help people understand this technology. He got scammed and at no point was trying to take advantage of his listeners. Boom. We 100% yeah, he might, support He might be him. like the most genuine guy in crypto. Yeah. The most what? I don't know if genuine's the right word. Maybe in uh pure-hearted. That's that's a good one. He's pure. Altruistic. Altruistic, enthusiastic. Yeah. Motivated. He's a good guy. Talk Bitcoin and Bitcoin accessories. He better hope he never gets sued by the king of the hill people. I miss I miss when he walks though, when he walked to work talking about it. I I wish yeah. he would bring that back. Those were the coolest. I agree. Yeah. I would agree with you there. Well, I got nothing else to talk about. Those are the two biggies I want to talk about. Intermediaries and that scammy shit. Um, I got nothing here. else to bring up. I mean, I think we're done. Yeah. We got anything coming up that we need to tell people about? Um, This week, uh, be on the lookout for a fresh announcements with Dr. Petty episode. Yep, yep. Probably a, a block channel. You know, we're we're gonna fill up your feed with some yeah. of that new new. There's gonna be some block channel action. There's gonna be some announcements action. Hopefully, there's gonna be another on ramping taking place. So look forward to that, Mister Miller. Also, we'll um, be we'll be pushing out syndicating uh, the Ether review as well as State Channel. Coming through our feed. So we're basically giving you guys a Kanban of cryptocurrency content. If you're unfamiliar with the con, sorry, Kanban, if you're unfamiliar with the term Kanban, you look at it every single time you go to the grocery store. You look at a giant pane of any product you'd ever want. 
Do you want Ruffles or do you want Tostitos? It's all in front of your face and you can select one. We're doing that with cryptocurrency media. So if you want to hear an on-wrapping, you get an on-wrapping. If you want to hear an announcement from Corey and, and see some new... What dog is that? Whose dog is that? Chloe. That's you Chloe. Hear, Sorry. If you want to hear an announcement from Corey and somebody's trying to sell their product, right? Go there. Maybe it's an ICO that works out. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, if you want to hear a newbie noob, get on Ram to come here. If you want to hear our main show, you go to the main show. There's just going to be a, just a wide variety of uh, stuff. So I wanted to keep everybody qualified. Holla. Um, yeah, we're going to wrap this up. So as always, on Twitter, at the BTC podcast, tweet to us. We'll tweet back at you, hopefully. Um, let's see. What else do we do? A medium. We, uh, if you if you go to Medium, you search the Bitcoin podcast. We have a blog. Corey posts his analyses there on where the money goes and how fast it goes that way in these ICOs. Uh, well, very well recepted analyses that you're doing, Corey. So keep doing that. I think the community loves it. I think they they like to get their eyes on it. Um, I, got, I got some things coming up. I got some stuff. I got some. I got some, um, I got some shit coming up. Yeah, of course, join the Slack if you go to the BitcoinPodcast.com or the EtherealPodcast.com or the EtherealPodcast.net or .org or .info. Or the BlockchainPodcast.com. <laughs> or the BlockchainPodcast.com. They all lead to us. They all come to us. So um, you can find us. Come in the Slack. One thing I would love to start doing, and we tr- we attempt this about every every three months and it never takes off. Is if you guys have topics or segments or something, some ideas that you'd love to hear from us when we do these shows, let us know. And we will try our hardest to incorporate it. Um, Because we actually make this show for you guys. So everyone who's joined the Slack is for you guys. How about this? I got something um, for you. If someone is still listening to this show, I want someone to give me a topic with a hashtag, Corey is the shit. I will give you... $10 Ten dollars in Bitcoin if you tweet that out with a topic. A hashtag Corey is the shit. The first you person. Ten dollars in Bitcoin. Disclaimer: First person who does that will get ten dollars in okay. Bitcoin with the topic. Corey is the shit. Give me a topic to talk about. That's what's happening. What if they spell your name wrong? They're they're noobs. <laughs> it's okay because I'm about to win ten bucks because I just tweeted them. That doesn't hashtag. count. You don't fucking count. <laughs> Ken doesn't count. Anyone a part of the show does not count. <laughs> <laughs> what up, Nathan? Uh, they talking shit? No, they weren't talking shit. That's my brother, audience. <laughs> Are they talking All right, shit? we're out of here. Later, bros. All right. Um, no, 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 no. We're not done. No. Yeah. Shout out to Zoe Saldana. God damn. It. Shout out to Never. Gucci Man. Burn. Gucci Mane. Oh. Gucci. Gucci Mane. You will Gucci. not drown that out. You will not take this moment from me. Shout out to Zoe Saldana. Uh, you're an angel and the world is better because you're in it Uh, Gucci um, play the outro
Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. Yeah. I want to do the sexy robot that made our uh, blurb at the top of these shows. Oh, I can send you her picture. Oh, is a per- that's a real person? I mean, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, I guess yeah. it is. Yeah, Why do you have a picture? Real because I ordered uh, from her account on Fiverr. So if you go through the account, it has lots of pictures over. Oh. Why does she need to put her picture up if she's doing voices? So you can Makes see she's hot. Oh, okay. She's look at, us, look at us all wearing the same headset. Yeah, we're standardizing. Ain't that a mofo? Ophelia was just standing. Like, she likes to watch the colors change. And she'll wait. Ooh. <laughs> so she's a fan. How do they feel? They feel all right? Yeah. Did she reach up and touch the headphones? Yeah, with her finger. That's wrong. You should have whooped her ass. No, I'm beat kidding. that I'm ass. Mess- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beat you. Yeah, beat that kid's ass. She, she can't do that. that. Kid's ass. Beat ass all day. I should get a T-shirt when I have a kid that says "Bad." Any second. Bad. Any second could be an ass whoop. Beat ass all day. <laughs> beat ass all day. D, we we can't raise our kids the way our dads raised us with Why ass not? beatings. We turned out good. We turned out good. We turned out pretty great. Dude, we were fearful all the time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's called functional fear is what it's called. It's my, called my... I'm afraid if I don't do and I'm afraid if I do do. So yeah. I'm going to find a happy medium in there. Every decision I made as a kid was like, if I get caught, will it be worth it? And that was like the determining factor. <laughs> I forgot what my brothers called it. My brothers called it something else. Like tough love. They just they just called it tough love. Yeah, it's tough love. Uh, they whooped my ass because they knew it would be good for me. <laughs> a random Wednesday afternoon, I think I'm going to punch Corey in the throat. Yep, I'm going to trip him. He's just, he just learned to walk. I'm going to trip his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Got to learn to get back up. So you guys have a good week. It's been long. Every yeah, fucking man, week. Me, yeah, man. I gotta do J O B. Are you yeah. ever gonna start a C A R E E R? Are you just gonna J O B to J O B until you can R I T I R E off this show? I, that's just kind of how my industry works, man. Right. Every every two years. You you bounce from one prestigious position to the other. Well, I guess you do have a C A R E E R. You just have he's like he's like three positions down from Dell, like the yeah. Dell. Yeah, it's definitely a C A R E E R. Yeah, I've well, never been exactly. an executive before. That's for sure. You're gonna probably be in a few <laughs> executive meetings in this role. Oh, I'm gonna. I'm I'm working. My boss is. Three people down from Michael Dell, so I'm probably going to meet him. Yeah, man. You should try and force that. You should say, hey, well, well, like, am I getting a Dell? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm getting a Dell. But they, maybe I can convince them to take Bitcoin again. I doubt it. Yeah. Too, much, too many fees. Could some take Litecoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin's, yeah. Bitcoin's done for payments. Yeah, Bitcoin's... You for, can't the, do it for, the, for the near future. For the near future. The 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 payment the payment fee may come down over the yeah, next I mean, well, that's year. That's gonna kill the crypt. That's gonna kill the currency, right? If you can't spend it, what's no, the point of it existing? Not at all. It's a, it's a great storage of value. If you were doing high value transactions, the average transaction value of of Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. Really? So if you're paying wow. So if you're paying three dollars to send three thousand dollars, so what? Yeah. Okay. That that's actually still way better than a bank. So that's so sad. So that, that's, um, that's fine. Who gives a shit, right? But there are other cryptocurrencies yeah. if you want to spend twenty five cents, right? Yeah. Go, Let me go see how those. well our bot worked here. I asked it to remind me of things we're going to talk about at eight p.m. So let's see uh, if it it's it's so, eight it's eight oh five for you. Look, okay. I'm just follow me on this line of question. You remember the Dick Van Dyke show, right? <laughs> I don't know where this is going. I told you, you know, I'm okay with it. You sure, you sure you want to you want to do it? Do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Do you remember the the Dick Van Dyke show? 
I heard of it. I never watched it. All right, what about Dragnet? I never watched that either. Fuck. What about... <laughs> did, did you watch Nick at Night? Uh, when Roseanne was, and right, Fresh cool. Prince were on. Cool, cool. So you watched Roseanne on... You watched Nick at Night, right? Yeah. And that's where you got really familiar with a lot of those shows, right? <clears throat> no, I just revisited them. I know where you're going with this analogy. You watch Dick Van Dyke uh-huh. that's in their 30s. You never watched Dick Van Dyke? Okay, anyways. I didn't expect you to say no. What? Who expect- watches Dick Van Dyke? Actually, it's the I other way around. I, I would have said no to this, too. I would have said no to this, Nobody too. Nobody watched Dick Van Dyke. Nobody watched Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> you guys did not watch Dick Van Dyke. No, nobody watched Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> Dude, I watched the shit out of Dick Van Dyke, and his wife was hot, and I loved it. Like, I would stay up late and watch Dick Van Dyke and Dragnet and all those really, really old shows. But anyways, I was going to, if you had said yes, like a normal red-blooded American, I was going to say, okay, you watched the hell out of them on Nick at Night, most likely, because they were syndicated on Nick at Night. Nickelodeon made Dick Van Dyke repopular. People got familiar with those things through a channel that it didn't exist on, that it wasn't created on. So it's going to be the same thing for us. We're going to have the blurb at the top of Arthur's show, and it's going to get syndicated through us. It's going to bring people, it's going to bring our audience to him, and it's going to bring his audience to us. I mean, that'd be a perfect analogy if he wasn't running his show on, an, on another channel. Yeah, so that I, was like- is, I didn't know that was happening. So that's like the Dick Van Dyke show running on primetime ABC, but then we're picking it up a couple hours Actually, later. And- it ran on NBC, but I know what you're saying. That's what syndication is. Like, Big Bang Theory runs on TBS, but it's syndicated on TNT. I'll say you this much. Like- so I if mean, someone's- Arthur doesn't talk to us. He's never in the Slack. I talk, like, to Arthur. Oh. I talk to Arthur all the time. Is he in the So he likes Slack? you then. Yeah, he, he loves me. You. We're friends. Me and Arthur are friends. <laughs> Well, he likes us. He doesn't know you two. Yeah. Do we need to get to I've, know him? Like, I've spent he, multiple days with Arthur. Well, let's grab dinner with and him. And every single November. time that we do an interview with Arthur, it's only me. Well, no. I was there for the first one, and I was going to be there for the second, but I dropped out. Hey, it's it like, works. Slackbot, it works. Oh, I it told you. All yeah, right. So to... this, is about, this is about what? Blockstack? Or this is this is a uh, no. This is um. It's prism. Eric Eric Voorhees. Yeah, this is prism. Maybe we should just get straight to Voorhees. Let me do an ad because a lot of people are going to tune in for Voorhees. I've been recording this whole time. Oh. Yeah, but we haven't said anything. No, we talked about fees and stuff. We're not putting this on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like That's in the beginning, happening. in the beginning of our show, we had a funny tidbit before every show yeah i like that that was some dumb shit that we said and then yeah, we moved to when the i had infinite time and i could sit through the 15 <laughs> yeah. minutes yeah. and find some shit i'm just trying to stop. give you give you fodder if you decide you needed something to become funny i'm cool with that as long as we get take the 10 seconds i can sit through the 15 minutes i don't mind it doesn't take me long to edit for your birthday, I'm going to get you a shirt that says, I have infinite time. Well, have maybe one day. Time. Hashtag infinite time. Have you guys heard that Logic CD? No. Man, one, it's good. Two, there is a skit in there with Neil deGrasse Tyson. There's two skits with Neil deGrasse Tyson that are like, boom, just blow your shit away. Neil deGrasse Tyson is like, one of my spirit animals. He has mm-hmm. to be. He's all right. I, I connect with him. Like we have similar mustaches. We have similar voice inflections. He has a flat top, which is not that cool. But we both like science. Like I want to hang out with the dude. I appreciate what he does. I'd like to hang out with him. I'd like to have like, some like some real physics conversations with him. He's I with that kind of... Bill Nye, a piece of shit. Mm. Yeah. I want to see what kind of appetizers he orders, you know? Start really copying his style. Like, take him to Chili's. Mozzarella sticks. Gets, like, mozz- oh, yeah, fuck around going to Chili's. Sticks. Give me a break. Bro, the Gross is down to earth. He ain't, going, he's to, he going, ain't going to Chili's. Chili's. Who doesn't go to Chili's? has the best chips and salsa of any chain brand. This is a fact. 
we're done being friends. Name one chain restaurant that has a better... any any real Mexican restaurant. Any of them. Name any of the real Mexican restaurants. They're well, better than Chili's. Being a chain you restaurant, just said it automatically rules out being a real Mexican restaurant. That's I'm talking dumb... about chain restaurant. That's not dumb. There's no chain Mexican restaurant that is anywhere near as good as like the Abuelita Shack down the street. We're done, when we're at DevCon, I want to eat some good dinners. We <laughs> if we're networking all day and we go to Chili's, I will be furious. <laughs> we're not going to go to Chili's when we're going to DevCon. Right, let's, we're right, let's, be... let's, let's do the show. I, I can't spend all night talking about I want chilies. presentation to be amazing. Like, I only need five French, French fries on my plate, but it better be presented damn well. When I go to DevCon. Okay, all right. In 10.